So this is me. Um, I've gotten research grants to my institution from Gilead and Vive, although I've got to tell you that I've been trying to um, eliminate all PI ships of any grants, and I'm about there, but so far I've, I still have two studies ongoing uh, with, they're funded by these companies, and I, um, but I don't receive any uh, direct funding from either of the companies. It goes to my institution. All right, so we're going to start with kind of easy and then get more difficult. So what do I do when a patient comes in and on the baseline genotype, they have an M184V? So this 30-year-old lady comes in and she's got initial uh, viral load is 28,000 and a CD4 count of 650. Her labs are normal. She's B5701 negative. Her genotype, though, shows this M184V. And uh, she doesn't plan to become pregnant. Um, uh, and she's okay to start therapy if you think she should. And rather than doing a formal poll, um, I guess the question on the table is, with an M184V, which of these regimens would you think might not work as well? Yeah, and I'm going to look at my chat box here. Uh, Let's see if anybody, um, you can either chat it in if you'd like, but if it might be easier if you just unmuted and started firing out, what do you think would be in trouble here? Uh, I wouldn't use seven. Okay. Um, I'd actually, I'd actually want to use a regimen that's got a high genetic barrier to resistance med in my regimen. So either Dalyategravir, Bictegravir, yep. or um, Darunavir. Yep, that's I agree, Gary. So what about item six? Would you use that? I would be reluctant, although the data has shown that there have people who have done very well. Um, if I didn't know, I might even consider it, but I wouldn't use it if knowing up front that somebody had three TC resistance because it would yeah. you know, be monotherapy to allutegravir. That's right. So, um, yeah, the points I think of this slide are exactly what Gary just said. Um, that you want with an integrase inhibitor as a rule and two nukes, um, especially one of them being either TAF or TDF, that it's okay that you can continue the 3TC or FTC. It'll still have about a half a log of effectiveness, even though on the phenotype it looks god awful. And we know that M184 be confer some resistance, the take home point is that it still works. And there have been lots of studies now of initial therapy looking back um, and seeing that the M184V does not interfere. And in fact, it may increase the activity to some degree of the tenofovir component. So that with the high genetic barrier agent, be it dolutegravir, it could even be darunavir, ritonavir, but I think this is mostly applicable to uh, dolutegravir or bictegravir, um, and and that's that's kind of the take-home point. Could alvitegravir work? Yeah, I think so, but we aren't really we're leaning as we talked about the other day. We're leaning away from using boosting agents as initial therapy because of the drug-drug interactions and the relative. Uh, and this is a relative comment. Um, less tolerability because of the boosting agent. The other one I thought I'd mention is the abacavir, uh, which does take a hit. It still has activity, but with the M184V, it takes a little bit of hit. You got a hit with a 3TC. The dilutegravir is probably robust enough in some way with the CD, with a viral load of 28,000 at baseline, but you had these other choices. And as I believe it was Dr. Sachs was commenting on Sunday, yeah, we're sort of not having much reason to use a Bacavir anymore. Um, and as Gary pointed out, the number six, I think we tend to lean away from that because there aren't enough data yet. And I think it's possible that you end up with more of a monotherapy with Dolutegravir. And even though some studies out of Europe, Spain in particular, have looked at Dolutegravir monotherapy, I don't think anybody's yeah. ready to use that right now, right? I'm trying to get my screen down. Other comments? Uh, seeing some things of second two NRTIs and a second gen 
Integrase inhibitor, okay. Yep, yep. It's, yep. Uh, high barrier resistance, so great. Avoid Robocavir, yep, we talked about that. So great. Uh, we're off to a good start. I think I'll move on in the interest of time to the next thing. So this is something that I'm sure everybody has seen. So you've got, right, you got a patient who's on um, Favarin's FTC TDF, you know, the old A tripla, if we're going to use trade names, and has been on it for quite a while. It's actually been 13 years. And, um, and so here's the story. So it's a 45 year old lady um, diagnosed 13 years ago. Initially, the viral load was modest. The CD4 count was kind of low, but it had a great response. And she's tolerating her fixed dose combination of Favarin's regimen great. And she's not having any symptoms and she feels well. So what do you think? And this isn't a terrible, difficult dilemma. It's just a common one, right? As every, everyone's seen this and everyone deals with this. So what do you do? Just open it up for commentary. Just, uh, it's probably better to use a microphone. You can't start somebody who's going out of the country. We've been here, we've been through this before with him. I wish I had been here to speak with him. I say if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> uh-huh. Stay the course. It'd be a, I call it a George Herbert Walker Bush. Mm -hmm. Not going to debt. Change wouldn't be prudent. That kind of thing. I, I offer, enter. I offer more, more um, recent alternatives like um, either an integrase based regimen or uh, with containing TAF, although TAF starting to get a little bit of a, some question marks, but um, it's really up to the patient and having a discussion. Mm -hmm. I'd have okay. a conversation with her about it because, you know, we did make a change for our youth and young adults to try and get them off of a Favarin's regimens. And many of them said, I want to, I want to stay on it. I have no symptoms. I have no problems. Some of them decided despite having no symptoms to change. And it was remarkable when they came back that they said, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I didn't think I had symptoms, but I actually did. Oh. So I would consider so, that. So Erica, what would you say? Let, let, let's role play. I'll be the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be the I'll be the lady and and you be my provider. Mm -hmm. So I'm in for the visit and we're finished up. I'm doing great. I'm I'm sailing along. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and role play here. What are you going to say to me? Well, I would say you know there are certainly newer agents that are available that we ha know have less side effects and sometimes the side effects of a Favarin's based regimens can be very subtle. I've certainly had patients who when they changed felt a lot better. That said, if you're tolerating it and doing well on it and you don't want to change, I completely understand that. But if you would be interested in doing a trial of a newer regimen and compare how you feel compared to the two regimens, that's something we could do. I hear you, Doc. I'm just real scared. I'm scared. I've done so well. This disease freaked me out when I got it and, and I've done great. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think I can change. Yeah, I, I completely understand that. I do want to tell you, though, since efavirenz came along, we've got medicines now that are more potent and even more safe with less side effects. So I wouldn't expect you to do worse with the new regimen. And if anything, I might expect an improvement. But again, ultimately, it's your choice, and I'll support either one you want to make. Great. Well done. So, you know, and we've all had this, I think everybody's had this conversation. I can't, if you have more than 20 patients in your practice, you've had this conversation with somebody who's uh, you inherited, even if you just started recently. And I think what you said, Erica, is just right, that we're trying to frame it, but the, the common response, and I didn't want to drag it on forever. I, what I hear back is not only I'm wedded to this, I'm afraid to go on to something different, is you say fewer side effects. I'm not having any side effects, right? And, uh, and, they, and they end up uh, uh, pushing back. So what you've done, I think, is just right. Any other comments uh, from folks? I, I would just say that it would be safe enough to say to her if she really didn't like it, she could switch back. Yeah, that's a good Give her point. a little bit of a cushion. I'm curious, just polling the group, just speak up, please, if this has happened. But you had somebody like this, you kind of encouraged them, they went with you, they went on to something else, and they had a problem. Has that happened to anybody? Yes. Tell us that's, about it. That's actually happened to me. I had a patient that I wanted to switch to, Bick Tarvey, and I switched him, and he had issues with weight gain, and he's like, no, I am going back on a tripola. 
So oh. I put him back on it. <laughs> yeah. And and did the weight gain reverse? We talked about that. Uh, no. <laughs> no <it> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other other common stories like that? Anything else? That's happened to me. And unfortunately, people's adherence kind of fell apart after making a change. They were reluctant to. And also, I think it affected their trust um, of the relationship. Yeah. So I, I, I haven't had that yet, but I, I, I know that it has happened from stories like I've heard. And you're, you're right. I can't tell who just said that. But um, the, the last comment, exactly right. It's, it's a little bit of a of a of a problem with trust, but I think as Erica did so nicely, and and uh, and and what we just heard um, uh, from the other story of going to Big uh if you frame it that we can always go back, let's keep in touch. I wouldn't just make the change and see him back in six months, right? You want to see him back sooner, get a sense of how it's going, even if it's just a phone call check in. I think that would be. Good. Uh, reading some of the comments here, um, uh, the weight gain didn't change. I think all of us are experiencing that. Um, I happened. It did. I had that happen with prep. Someone switched to SCOBY and had a side effect. Wanted to go back. Um, would be able to sample patients to not change the insurance. Ah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so the, the, the insurance is an issue. So you probably don't want to give a 90-day supply uh, in case you want to go back. You want to probably make it a 30-day supply to start. So in case they have to switch, your insurance company isn't screaming. We just paid for 90, and that's a really good point. Michael? Thing, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Another thing that I've done is at the first visit, I've said we're just getting to know each other. I just want to start planting a seed in your mind. And because I see patients who are new to the practice more frequently, I give them information. And then when they come back, we talk about it again and often change at the second visit. Okay. Michael. Yeah, just one last comment. She's 45, approaching menopause. I just, part of the education piece would be um, looking at TDF and the effect on bone and aging. Just to bring that up as discussion, not looking to change as you build that report, just to bring it up as part of the discussion. All right, so stay with me, Michael. Um, let's look back at our slide here. Um, would you go to TAF, FTC, Ropivirine? Well, I'm not looking to change. I mean, she's not menopausal yet, probably perimenopausal, um, but just to- well, let's, make her, let's make her 55 and postmenopausal. Well, um, that's an option. Yeah. Uh, if there's no underlying resistance, non-nuke resistance. Nope. Nope. Um, it's, it's, it's an option, um, yeah. but uh, <clears throat> that's a better option possibly. But it, again, I'd want to do a DEXA probably on her soon after 50. Um, and menopause and just monitor because I'm family practice trained. I would be mo focusing on that and look and see where she is and just look at options. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I've done that. I've gone to Rolpivirine uh, because I think it's a great role for that drug. It, you've already got them. You have to look for the uh, use of a PPI and that type of thing. The viral load initially was below 100,000, but I've found that even if it was above 100,000, once it goes below, it seems to still work, but I'm not pushing that. I'm just making some editorial comments here. Um, one of the questions was about uh, 3TC dolutegravir. Sure, uh, as long as there wasn't a baseline M184V, I think, as we just discussed, and maybe it's okay even if there was one. I'm a little bit more leery of that, but yeah, that'd be a good regimen. That could work. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with uh, Erica's comment here about really important to see people back after four weeks of any change, uh, and, and Alex agreed as well. So yeah, um, any other comments before we go to the next case? Yes, I, um, I have one. Um, yeah, I've just I've gotten a little less aggressive on this in this scenario with the integrase inhibitors and the weight gain. Um, you know, I think a year or two ago I was. I push this a little harder than I'm now because of that issue, especially in, in a woman on this age. Yeah. How, what about others? Uh, how are people with Steven on that? I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think there's so much, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of strange. We talked about that a little bit on Sunday about the shiny object, right? We go to the new thing and it looks great and it plays out. And then 
there's some tarnish that happens over time, which is really almost to be expected. Um, but I think uh, all of us would probably counsel if we're going to go to a uh, uh, an integrase inhibitor like Bictegravir or uh, Dalutegravir, we should raise it. We heard about the one story. I mean, this might also be an argument for ropivirine because I don't think you're likely to see that going from a non-nuke to a non-nuke. Um, okay, I've been mean, getting denials from insurance for 3TC Dalutegravir treatment experience. Wow, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're kind of uh, we're kind of there. The question from um, uh, looks like Dietrich, uh, low CD4 count of concern. If the initial CD4 count was low, you might be a little bit concerned for initial therapy, but I don't find that to be a problem once the patient's already suppressed and switching over. I think that's pretty good evidence it works okay. Um, and then label for art treatment experience just changed. Uh, so maybe that can change or help with the insurance company. Um, I was Deb, just gonna... Deb adds, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Is it, I'm, is I'm it Jay, Jay 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 is it? Jay yeah, Jay Han. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice. Yes. Welcome, How, nice to see you. Likewise, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm from UW uh, or University of Washington in Seattle. Yeah. And, um, I was just gonna add to that, you know, after Croy in 2019, I started talking about the weight gain with patients just saying like, hey, there were some there's some data, there were four abstracts. It was mostly associative data. Um, and then talking through sort of the options. Um, and I was sort of surprised, just like letting them know, but telling them that I think that the INSTEs are best um, as opposed to Rilpivirine, which I'm not a very big fan of. And it, I'm surprised as to how many people were like, no, it's okay. Like, I'm willing to sort of take on this risk of the weight gain, even though it's all just association at, the mo at that time. Um, and sort of see how they do because they wanted to know what yeah. was best. And so what I was doing was just offering them nutrition visits at that first visit, or at least saying like, do you want a, a referral to nutrition? And then at my one, at my like four week follow up for viral load, also saying, hey, come back for a four week um, weight check, um, sort of that it's like on their mind. But I've been sort of surprised at the, the number of people that have been not okay with the risk, but like want the best medication despite the risk of weight gain. And obviously now my sort of conversation has changed um, a little bit um, to sort of talk about the combination of TAF and all that uh, with the INSTEs, but I've, I've been pleasantly surprised. And what I've really said with patients is that sort of to the whole point is I want them to have a symbiotic relationship with their medication, not an antagonistic relationship with their medication. So sort of whatever is gonna make them take it the most yeah. is what we're going for, so. I love that. That's a, that's those are great comments. Um, I, I think what you, you know, what's kind of unique. Um, it's not obviously fully unique, but uh, what's unique is almost the universality of how each of us are are remarkably effective at being patient advocates. And um, it's always been heartening to me on all of these workshops and just hanging around. Sometimes I've gone and visited other clinics. I've certainly been to the clinic at UW and um, a lot of places. And it's like a universal thing. Maybe it's the Ryan White Care Act that kind of orients us that way because it, it pays for a lot of the ancillary services that I know I would love to have in my provider's office, um, but there's no way that ordinary uh, fee-for-service payments cover that kind of cost. And so we're really kind of fortunate and our patients I think are fortunate that the Ryan White Care Act exists um, to help us with that. Any other comments on this case? Okay, if not, I will move on. This is something we alluded to, uh, and I wanted to get into a little bit more detail uh, from our conversation on Sunday. So it's a patient with a discordant CD4 count. So we have a 30-year-old lady who started on TDFFTC and boosted darunavir three years ago. Initial viral load was 78,000, the CD4 count was 80. Uh, viral load came down nicely, but now we're uh, three years later, and the CD4 count is still less than 200. And we, I could probably have made this even more, uh, 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 more difficult than saying the CD4 count of baseline was 10, and now it's 65. Okay, so basically we're not seeing that bump that we normally see, and she's tolerating a regimen. So the question on the table, to quote Hamilton, um, is uh, do we uh, change, and if so, to what? Or do we, you know, 
again, go back to Herbert Walker Bush and stay the course, change wouldn't be prudent. Uh, who wants to jump in first? I would continue her current antiviral regimen. I don't think that we really have any data to show that different regimens are gonna have an impact on CD4 cells. Yeah, looks like a lot of people are in agreement with you, Gary. So tell me, um, Go expand a little more. Say, say, let's say I'm, I'll play patient with you here. Um, hey, doc, I, I go to these parties and people are telling me who have this HIV that their CD4 counts have gone through. What's wrong with me? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. I think your immune system is just not reconstituting. It's just not restoring your, your CD4 cells the way they do in some other people. Um, but, but you know, it's, it doesn't mean that over time, it just may take more time for you, for your immune system to reconstitute. You're young, you're only 30 years of age, um, and younger people tend to have more of a boost in T cells. So I would give it more time, but making a change isn't going to really do anything differently other than suppress your virus. Yeah, well done. I, I, I agree completely personally. Um, but, uh, you know, there may be some folks who want to change. I don't want to inhibit that response. So does anybody want to change or what would you change to? Um, okay. So um, everyone in the chat room is here agreeing. One of the questions was, uh, what about the percentage? Actually, that's a great point because the percentage hasn't really changed that much. So usually the percent CD4 goes up with the in concert with the CD4 count. Why? It, just a basic review of that is remember that uh, the CD4 count is actually a calculation. It's the total white count times the percent lymphocytes times the percent CD4. Now you could have a fancier answer where they're actually measuring CD3, which is all circulating lymphocytes, and then you take percent CD3 times the number of lymphocytes in the, uh, uh, you can count out the number of lymphocytes and then multiply times the percent CD4. But either way, um, assuming the white count isn't, isn't bouncing way high or the percent lymphocyte isn't going up, it really is the percent CD4 that's a leverage point on what the, what the CD4 count does. And I think this is another one of those historic things that go back to the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when they focused on the count, but they, we could have just as easily focused on percent CD4 and probably been no different in terms of all the things that we associate with a CD4 count. Um, so uh, greater than 100 virally suppressed, comfortable. Uh, ah, so the question is, what about uh, prophylaxis? Gary, I'll pick on you again. Um, sorry, but um, what, do you, what would you do if she's now, let's say she's had uh, more than a year uh, above above 100, her viral load suppressed. She's on trim sulfa still. Is this a time to stop that? Well, you know, if you asked me this question two days ago, I would have, without, without question, continued somebody until their CD4 count went above 100. But with what I learned the other day, uh, a CD4 count of 100 or greater and somebody who's been virally suppressed for more than three months, um, it's safe to stop the, the PCP prophylaxis. So that was new information to me. Yeah, we usually wait six to 12, but you're right. I think, you know, that we're learning as we go, which is what we're doing with COVID as well, I might add. But, um, but the take home point is exactly what you said. And, and so, yeah, I think we're okay with that. The other thing that's changed since uh, a lot of us went through this uh, go in the 90s is that we're really not using MAC prophylaxis anymore, right? With, right. Uh, if you're even at the CD4 counts below 50, um, and I'll, I'll explain why that is on the next slide. Uh, everyone's sort of agreeing with stopping the backroom. So yeah, I think we're on the same page. Um, another study I'll share with you real quickly um, is one that uh, in 1994, we, we had started using viral load in 92, if you can believe that. Uh, we had this is well before Roche got involved. And we were working with a group out of Gene Labs, which was in Redwood City, California. And a guy, Jeff Lifson, who a lot of you still know, and he's at um, 
up at NCI and uh, outside of Mar in Maryland. Um, he, um, he called me out of the blue because he heard we had a repository and I sent him samples of plasma from a wide range of people. And he had a way of quantifying virus uh, by using quantitative competitive PCR. We don't use that anymore, but he had it. And it was remarkably, uh, remarkably uh, accurate in terms of relating to what the virus uh, and its relationship to CD4 and stage of disease. So we started using that. And so I was um, having some patients like this who seemed to be relatively suppressed. Um, and some who were in that range, like we talked about the other day, remember where they had still detectable virus and the verapine had just come out. And so we did an experiment where we just added a verapine to that whatever existing regimen and we didn't see a change in anything. If they had detectable virus at let's say 85 or 100, it stayed right there. It didn't matter. Why? Because there was no de novo replication for it to further suppress. That was just a function of, as we talked about the other day, residual reservoir that's spitting out virus every now and then. It spills into the bloodstream and you detect it. But adding another antiretroviral agent doesn't change that. And um, the CD4 count also didn't budge. So changing a regimen, there, there's very little, um, very little evidence that that happens. Real quickly, we see on, on a different point, um, secondary prophylaxis. So somebody had PJP, and I think the guidelines are the same. And let me go to the next slide, and I can explain a couple things here that, uh, that relate to both of these topics. So here we have on the lower half of the viral load suppression and the upper half the CD4 count rise. And what we like to see is that, right? Viral load comes down rapidly. In fact, with integrases even more rapidly um, than even a protease inhibitor. And then it just goes to undetectable and stays there for years and the CD4 count goes up. But there are patients who for whatever reason, like our patient here, um, just don't get that CD4 count increase. And the reason, as I've alluded to uh, back on Sunday, is, is, the, is the following. So um, another study that um, we had done with pathology was pre and post antiretroviral therapy lymph node biopsies. Yes, we actually did that in the 90s and um, worked with ENT and they removed either an actually but oftentimes a cervical biopsy uh, pre-therapy and then somewhere between four and six months post-therapy. And what it showed us was that um, if you look at the pre-therapy, you could do in situ hybridization, see lots of virus everywhere. But importantly, the adhesion molecules, ICAM and VCAM, were elaborated in large amounts. So if you stain for that, you see them there. And those are responsible for trapping cells in lymphoid tissue. At the six or four month or three month uh, lymph node, not only was there very little virus there, which gets back to that principle of viral load is proportional to the number of cells in the body producing virus. Um, so that as a viral load came down the number of cells, it was really hard to see an in situ hybridization cell expressing virus at that moment. But the ICAM and VCAM was almost completely gone. And so what we deduced was that in that first couple of weeks to month or two, the viral load comes down. That was stimulating the ICAM and VCAM. They start, they're no longer elaborated and the cells are released back into circulation. And if you look real carefully here, it's mostly in that first six weeks that we see that increase and that's a redistribution phenomena. So for whatever reason, the patients who have the CD4 count discordance are those who didn't get that release, who didn't get that benefit. And the second part, the second phase, if you will, you notice that the lines are moving in mostly parallel after about three months. Um, and that's the normal replenishment of CD4s. That's, that's what we normally see. How do we know that? Well, back again in the early or mid nineties, in rheumatology, uh, they had, in some patients, high levels of CD4, and they felt like they were uh, interfering or causing some of the rheumatologic problem. So they, this is one of the earliest monoclonal antibodies that was created. It was an anti-CD4 antibody. And so they administered that to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. 
And what they saw was a drop in the CD4 count, but then it came back within several months or several weeks to months. Um, but if they gave a second or third and third dose, the CD4 count came down and it hardly came back at all. And if they followed them out over time, the slope of increase after they had basically destroyed the CD4 counts that were there came back very, very, very slowly to this same point. So that I'm guessing, I'll underscore that word, I'm guessing that there's some replacement of CD4 that happens naturally when it's been knocked out, um, but it's, it's a slow recovery. So let me um, go to questions here. Um, uh, what if the patient's been stable for three years with undetectable between 50 and 100? Ah, we don't know about CD4 counts between 50 and 100. Um, let me uh, harbor a guess and then get your all's comments uh, on the microphone. Um, so if you think about it, once viral load goes down, let's take your case of a 50, or let's make it even more dramatic. Somebody has 25 CD4 cells and a viral load of a million, and you treat them, and the viral load 16 weeks later is now undetectable, and the CD4 counts may be gone to 50. How many cases do you see in that setting, assuming iris, we aren't going to talk about iris, which could happen? But beyond that sort of three or four month period, even though the CD4 count hasn't risen, viral load suppressed. How many cases of CMV retinitis do you see in that type of patient? None. How many cases of MAC de novo do you see? None. Don't see it. And I think the reason for that is because the virus is really the evil character here. And so, yeah, the CD4 count's kind of a marker in some ways of somewhat how long they've had this. And yeah, it's a rough guesstimate of what the immune system might be able to do. But it's really not a metric of immune function. It's a metric of just how many CD4 cells are there. And we associated CD4 counts, and for that matter, CD4% with an epidemiologic risk of a probability of PJP or MAC or CMV or you name it. And we assume that that was function, but it really isn't. The function is measured by functional assays, right? So to me, the virus is what causes the dysfunction. And when the virus is high in high numbers, it's binding to CD4 receptors on almost every cell. And the cell can't function well. You get rid of the virus, no matter what the CD4 count is, after three or four months, the function improves. And in fact, in, in the four week, six week period, that's exactly why you see iris. Because you've stripped away the virus, the CD4 function, the whole immune system function wakes up and boom, it says, whoa, what's this shit? And it starts attacking, right? And it just goes crazy and that's what you see. So it's really the viral load the virus in the bloodstream or in the lymphatic tissue actually, that's messing around with the ability of the immune system to function. So now back to the question, um, could you stop or should you stop when a CD4 count is say, say 85, it's been a year of undetectable, are you okay stopping PJP prophylaxis? Don't know. Uh, theoretically, I would say maybe, yes, but there was the study that was published in CID, I think 2011 or 2012, that established that 100 to 200 value where there wasn't a difference. But when they did look at people who weren't able to get above 100 CD4 cells and virus was suppressed, they did see a little bit more, especially in the secondary PJP. So I, I don't know. Um, other comments? What about secondary prophylaxis of CMV or histo? Typically wait till the CD4 count is above 100. And what's the significance of CD4, CD8 ratio? Great question. I find that most helpful in the scenario of the elite controller like we talked about before. That's about the only place where I find it meaningful clinically. And so in other words, if I have a person who 
naturally has, um, with HIV infection, an undetectable viral load with no therapy, if that CD4, CD8 ratio is below 0 0.5, they're going, I'm going to encourage them to go on therapy just like as if their viral load was 15,000 because those are the people in the studies that have shown they're the ones who are going to progress more rapidly to a detectable virus. If the CD4 ratio, CD4, CD8 ratio is above one, then I might watch if they don't, especially if they're not excited. But personally, I'm going to, like we talked about the other day, I'm going to encourage folks to get to get involved, uh, to get on therapy if they can. Um, and then uh, Veronica, thank you for agreeing with me, says I'm 100% right about the virus. Most of us old timers came to this. Um, I still, however, would not stop the prophylaxis, came up how long it takes. I, I agree with you, Veronica. I'm not stopping when it's below 100 just because I, I don't have any data. Um, and there may be something different otherwise. Uh, what's the reason, why is it that someone doesn't get that bump in CD4. It's probably, among other things, that their lymphoid architecture has been destroyed. Think of it as the Gettysburg battlefield, right, where pickets charge and all that. They're all fighting and bodies laying around at night, people groaning. I mean, that's the immune system fighting the virus for a long time. And that battlefield leaves scars. And so that there could be that the immune system can't function as well. I, I don't know. Just making a lot of that up. So let me, let me move on. Um, sorry, a couple more comments. So for those folks who are sluggish to improve their CD4 count, assume you just wait for the viral load to go down, yep, and be suppressed, right, and vaccinate even not above 200. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, for other vaccinations, uh, you might use them, I think especially above 100. 100. The live vaccines are a little bit more problematic, <clears throat> but I think if it's between 100 and 200, I might lean, if I really needed to give a live vaccine, I might do it, but I'd try to still avoid based on guidelines uh, to above 200. Um, and then how long do you wait? <clears throat> it's going to take a long time for the CD4 count to rebound in this setting. Um, my longest one to get to 200 was about 16 years. Um, it was a woman who I still take care of. And she was 5'11" and weighed 75 pounds when I first saw her um, with, with some of the worst herpes outbreak, uh, general herpes I've ever seen. Uh, looked like a malignancy. And she recovered. And she got, her original therapy was ritonavir liquid back in 1994. Age is important. Yep. Older patients have slower CD4 current recovery. Yep. And that's exactly right. Uh, so great point, uh, EP. Appreciate that. Um, let me just kind of move on. This is where I think the, the whole talk was based on a complex patient. 57-year-old diagnosed with HIV in 1991, multiple opportunistic infections, claims of pill fatigue. He's taken most of the available agents, um, but no exposure to dolutegravir or elvitegravir <clears throat> or bictegravir. Um, <clears throat> currently on TDF, FTC, etravirine, Boosted varunavir and raltegravir. CD4 count now is 330. Yay, good for him. Nader was six. We just talked about him. Uh, now the viral load is low uh, and, and suppressed, but he's on God knows how many pills. This is what his genotype looked like along the way. It's pretty ugly, right? You may have a little bit of activity of tenofovir still, at least by phenotype. But remember, we didn't talk about this, but phenotypes for nukes isn't all that great. It's, it's okay, but somehow in all the gamish of whatever he's got there, um, looks like the tenofovir may even be uh, leaning towards hyper susceptible, but it's, it's, let's say it still works. And everything else is kind of toast. And I don't think I'd give my worst enemy trypanavir. So that's probably not going to be an option. So do you continue the nine pills? He says he has pill fatigue. Um, I, I, you can pick whatever you want. Let's just open it up for commentary. And if you have a favorite here, just create your own regimen. What what would you do? Remember, he's on raltegravir now and seems to have success. Um, also on boosted darunavir now. Uh, Want to simplify the pills? What are you going to do? I've used 
big Tavi and press Kovic on someone like this. Okay. And you do that you do the Darunavir uh, once a day or twice a day. Well, you know, with his old phenotype, I'd be worried I would have to consider twice a day, but then I might be more inclined to give him Ritonavir. Now that you say yeah. that, it makes me question whether we should think about Bastemavir. Keep it more simple. Yeah. Wasn't he resistant to Darunavir? He was. But so, remember, no. let me go back. But let me, uh, oops. Uh, just uh, oh sorry. Let me go back to the genotype or the phenotype. Um, so the darunavir, yeah, it was pretty resistant. Um, so I think typically, if we're going to use it, we might lean towards twice there. Um, but it, this is a hard case. There, I will start at the outset and say there is not <laughs> obviously the the gene the, the, the there is not a, a perfect answer. Although he's having success with nine drugs now. The question is, which of the nine might be, uh, which of the nine might be uh, working best? Can you all see this still or not? Did no. Come off the all right, nope. let me, let me, let me reshare. Um, see it now? Yes. Okay. And let me see if I can make it a little better. We'll just keep that up. Can you all still see it? Yes. Great. So, Gary, you've got the mic. Uh, well, he's not been on dogutegravir, so that's certainly something I would, I'd want him to be on an, a high, ge, a high uh, genetic barrier integrase. Um, I, would, I, I would get rid of the etrovirine because we have doravirine, and it's only once a day. You could even consider the doravirine that's co-formulated with TDF and um, 3TC. So with that with dogutegravir has got him two pills um, and we can consider stopping the darunavir or we could get a, we, we could get an, a genotype uh, archive to see whether or not th that he's really getting, he's, he has resistance, but I mean, the genotype shows that he, he's got resistance to darunavir. So I would, I would consider the, the Duravarine, uh, TD, TDF, 3TC, and dalutegravir. Um, and I don't think dalutegravir would need to be um, dosed twice a day. There's not drug-drug interactions yeah. with um, that regimen. We'll throw that out. Let's say we do an integrase inhibitor uh, uh, check on whatever the DNA. He's never had resistance. So you've got a really active drug with dalutegravir or with bictegravir. Yeah, I think so the question is, can you get by with those two drugs, the combo Duravarine uh, TDF and, uh, and Dalutegravir alone? That'd be two um, things. Other thoughts from other folks? I really like that regimen because, I mean, the nice thing is you'll maintain your M184V, which should push your tenofovir to hypersusceptibility. So you should have three good active agents in a minimal yeah. pill burden. Okay. Thanks, Erica. Um, who think, would be? Go ahead. I think I think in situations like this, there's really a big difference between transitioning someone who's currently undetectable to a different regimen and maintaining undetectable versus someone who has lots of resistance who's got a lot of virus. Yeah. Had lots of luck keeping people undetectable, even with these horrible. Most of them I get from Erica, who um, sends me these uh, young adults who've had troubled youth. Um, but if they're, if they're undetectable, switching them and keeping them undetectable has been much easier than getting them undetectable. Yeah. And by the way, EP, I, I love the fact you're in an exam room. I don't know if that's a background or what, but you got... You, <laughs> I'm, you in, look, I'm in clinic. You look like a real <laughs> doc there. I, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's fantastic. We should take a screenshot of that. Um, <laughs> one thing about being virtual. What about just anybody want to comment on Fostimzavir or Ibilizumab? Any role for that here? He doesn't need it. I mean, we've got other active agents. I think if he were, if he had really significantly more um, viral resistance and we really needed a second agent, then uh, I mean. Ibuluzumab is every two weeks of an infusion, so that's that's uh, pretty difficult. Um, Fostemsevir would be an option if we only had one active drug and we needed to add a second. 
and it's twice a day. Right. Yeah. Other thoughts? Anybody else want to pipe in? I, I shut down my chat, so let me bring that back. Oh, the non new thing. I guess I better look. Let's see what we got. Um, let's see. We like we like the uh, the big Tegravir with Duravirine. That would be two drugs. That's a good option. Um, yep. Let's see. So a lot of folks are agreeing with what we've heard from our participants. Voice your concern now. Yeah. Is it, what about his adherence? Uh, I mean, obviously he's taking the non-pills, but the fact that he comes in complaining of pill fatigue, that, you know, we got to, we got to kind of listen to that, don't we? Um, yeah. Uh, as long as we had other effective meds. Yep. And then, all right, let's, I'm going to go to Rachel next because uh, she has a case and I asked y'all to bring those. I didn't mean to go on so long, but it, it just, we got sort of, I got into sort of a role there on talking about some of this stuff. Do you mind explaining the difference between GS archive and regular resistance testing and why it sometimes shows resistance? Yeah. So basically uh, the archive is going into the to the um, reservoir cells. So the thing is that once replication has happened, <clears throat> it's coming out of a cell and the resistance um, that's elaborated as replication is going on, those, uh, um, those integrated viruses remain. And even though the majority, 99% of cells that were producing the virus are eliminated within a day, that less than 1% group remain. And <clears throat> so since you can't uh, check the plasma when the viral load's undetectable to amplify, you go in, you find that DNA that's integrated and you, you, you amplify it and then you do resistance tests there. Um, there is some problem, there are some problems with that because the question is how representative it, representative it is. And, uh, but it is pretty much all we, all we have. But yes, it's incorporated into a cell that does not have replication ongoing. That's exactly right. So your understanding is correct, Jenny. Um, Philip says, uh, would you use TAP, FTC, BIC, and a newly approved? Sure, you could do that. I think that could work. Uh, that's exactly what the drug company that makes Fostimzavir would love for you to do. So, but it is, it is a decent option. It is between TAF being preferable to TDF. Um, I don't think so. F, as far as efficacy, no. Uh, there shouldn't be any difference because the dose difference, 300 of TDF, 25 of TAF, um, are really going to be uh, roughly equivalent. Uh, why not TAF, FTC, BIC alone? Hmm, maybe. You'd have kind of two active drugs there and a half or a third of another. It'd be a little bit, um, you'd want to have see them back kind of often to make sure that they're not breaking through. Uh, but, you know, gosh, if you could do that and get away with it, that'd be pretty fabulous. And, but I think we'd all be uh, wanting to follow that person very quickly. So the uh, AP typed in um, while he was sitting in his computer wearing a stethoscope in his clinic, uh, 100I, 103N, and the Stanford database, and it says a patient might be resistant to deravering. I was wondering that. Thank you for doing that. I didn't do that yet. So that could be a problem with deravering. Um, Maraviroc, uh, he had, he, it went through, uh, uh, if the profile showed R5, yes, could work. All right, so we got 10 minutes left. I'm going to turn back to Rachel. Rachel, are you okay on muting and presenting your case, or do you want me to do that from what you wrote on the chat? Okay, not hearing anything. I will read your case from the chat. So the case question. Viral load undetectable for years on TAF, FTC, and a third agent. I find an own genotype that shows K65R and an M184V. Should I switch off and go to an NRTI sparing regimen? So let's throw that out. So the viral load is undetectable on a TAF or TDF regimen. What do you do? Would you stay the course or would you switch? Anybody? He's undetectable and tolerating it. I'd stay the course. Anybody else? 
I would stay the course. Yeah. There was K65R in a few patients in the, in the Big Tarby studies, and uh, people were still suppressed. Yep. And I, I've seen that in patients that have transferred to me where a historical genotype will show a K65R, and they've been on like Truvada, whatever, for a long time and been suppressed. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. I, I've, I would. I would agree, I think, with the comments that I'd probably say the course, the proof's in the pudding. Um, yep. And as long as we're, you know, as long as we're following along and the viral load doesn't come back up, the good news, as we've said, maybe a lot this conference is both the Bictegravir and Dalutegravir have a really high barrier to resistance. So you're going to have to have a regimen failing for quite a while before you're going to evolve on those two particular drugs as opposed to, say, Raltegravir. Um, or Elvitegravir. So, uh, Amy says, I have a new patient who was diagnosed with HIV 18 years ago and never started on ART. Now 60 reports she did not get treatment because her numbers were good. Is it possible not to get ART if you are HIV positive? Uh, not anymore. Um, but, you know, that's 18 years ago we were holding off and uh, those of you who know me know that I was <laughs> almost having seizures screaming that we should be treating everyone. Um, and yeah, so it, the only people we might not treat right now uh, are those elite controllers, which is why I included them. Um, there could also be social or psychosocial issues that interfere, but biologically everyone should be treated uh, in my opinion. Issue of sorting out elite controllers from false positive. Yeah, so that's especially important in pregnant women um, uh, where the antibody could be positive. And the, the cellular DNA assay really would do it for us. That's sometimes how we um, adjudicate children, infants born to moms who are positive and the antibodies cross. So the HIV DNA level would, would distinguish that for you. All right, so Debbie says, I have a case of a, a 57-year-old, um, I lost my pointer here, there we go, a 57-year-old man with poor adherence, never seen that before. He also has hep B, not controlled. CD4 is four, which last time I looked is kind of low, yeah. and the viral load is 50, almost 53,000, yeah. and the HBV is susceptible. Standard, Stanford database has a high level of resistance to all the nukes, low susceptibility to, to rabarine, intermediate to darunavir and to pranavir, and no integrase resistant. Want to construct a new palatable regimen for him. Uh, okay, that sounds pretty real world to me, Debbie. Um, <laughs> but, so, um, not to mention that he's had KS in the past okay. and, he, and he's bullheaded. Yeah. Um, it, I, I'll just cut to the chase because we have, uh, we're running a little, little bit low on time here, but uh, the hardest thing are these folks who are intermittently adherent and I'm sure you've had the conversation. Well, help me understand. That's the way I usually probe it. Help me understand what what's what's getting in your way what what right. what are the things that you're encountering that that make you um make it hard for you to keep up with your medicines and sometimes it's hopefully it's side effects because we can work through that right mm -hmm. uh but oftentimes well, you know i just or i might be using meth and i just get on go on a bender and i just forget to take it right. um you know that type of thing uh so it really depends but assuming that Let's assume it's side effects. You know, the, the integrase inhibitors are your anchor here, right? And then the question is, what do you add to it? Um, and so th the boosted protease inhibitors, while they're very potent um, and good drugs, I, I find that a lot of people have to intolerance issues. Um, I, I, would, I would lean towards um, maybe a durabarine with TDF, and you could also throw some, uh, maybe a little bit of 3TC or FTC on as a crouton on the salad. But um, hepatitis B. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and you know what else I've done? And you've probably done this too, Debbie, is I'll pull the, the chart off the wall or take him to the chart and say, show, point out the drugs to me that you didn't have any problem with. <laughs> you know, the little pictures and go, which ones bothered you? We'll avoid those. And I, I it doesn't always work, but I, I found that in bo- involving them in the decision making, sort of like letting them choose off a menu, what do you want? And if they're picking stuff that I think is going to work, I go, yeah, that's great. Let's try that. Uh, see you back in three weeks. Let's see how it's doing. I think you can do it this time. And that's, I think, the best you can do. It's, it's a real art at that point. Um, uh, what were you thinking, Debbie? Well, I'm fi- I'm fine myself because I'm old school too, and I know all the old drugs. I'm trying to think how do I pull in some of the newer things that we're being told about that are becoming available. And right. It's you know newer with less pills based on some of the stuff that we're that's coming out for us to use. Right, and the injectable might be okay, but it's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year, something like that, and it's an injection every two weeks. Um, which could be an option if they're really into it. And uh, but the twice daily Fostemzavir, I really worry about hitting that second dose. Um, and it's unfortunate for the drug that it, it's, it's that way. Um, we got, got three minutes left. Did that help? Did that help a little bit, Debbie? Are you okay? Yeah, thank you. All right. And let's we'll do one more thing. Um, just comment here. Stephen would repeat tests in a month and then consider sending to UW for DNA testing. Okay. Um, I've repeated times two with Samuel's easy to send to UW. Yeah. Lab is super helpful. Great. Thanks so much. We have five minutes left. Now we have three minutes left. Um, all right, Rebecca, I'm going to go to your case here and then we'll wrap up 70 year ish year old, person from therapy for 30 years. Good for them. Um, Underlying chronic hepatitis B, CKD stage four, creatinine clearance of 20, previously on a lot of different things. Um, Tried to simplify regimen, having difficulty remembering to take all the medicines. Changed them to 3TC, renal dosing, TAF, raltegravir twice daily. Okay, HBV viral load is decreasing slowly. Viral load is undetectable. Is, is liver function and tests are trending upwards. Wow. Yeah, in about 30 seconds, we can fix this, I think. Um, I'm teasing. This is a tough case. I think the hardest part uh, really here is the renal trouble. And, uh, you know, the, I'm a little bit nervous about the TAF, although you probably can maybe get away with it. Um, and I don't, but you got to almost have it on board for the HBV. You could try it. Maybe I have to go look up and see how to dose reduce or dose adjust in Tecavir, but maybe you're better off with just TAF. I, I would think um, for in the 70s, I, I might stay the course with what you're doing. I can't come up with anything a boatload better just without thinking about it some more. Anybody else have uh, advice for, uh, for Rachel here? Oh, Rebecca, sorry. That's a tough one. So we'll finish maybe with that. Um, yeah, we've got great kind of back and forth between the groups. We're, we're, at, we're at the end of the time right now. I'm so sorry that I've spoke for so long. I didn't in, um, inhibit the cases I asked you to bring. Um, so... At any rate, I am very grateful for the opportunity to be with you. Um, glad that we're having the conference still, even though it's virtually. Um, so I want to remind you that uh, the actual clinical conference starts in about 15 minutes. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, hear from Tony Fauci, among others. Um, should be a good conference. So thanks. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, Uh, early afternoon or late morning, depending on where you are. And uh, thanks for participating. It was a great session. Appreciate everybody's active involvement.